hi students today i am going to deal with grating monochromators before dealing with grating monochromators i would like to tell you about the objectives learning objectives of today's presentation we are going to after completion of this presentation you will be able to understand what is a grating what is a grating monochromator and the types of light sources which are used for the visible region what is grating before going to discuss about grating let me once recap what is a monochromator a monochromator is a optical device which is used to isolate a narrow band of wavelengths it is used to isolate a narrow band of wavelengths monochromator consists of entrance slit collimator grating or the prism which is nothing but the dispersive medium then we have the focusing lens and the exit slit the primary function of a monochromator is to provide a beam of radiant energy of given nominal wavelength and spectral bandwidth the primary function of the monochromator is to provide a beam of radiant energy of given nominal wavelength and spectral bandwidth so the performance of a monochromator depends on the resolution it depends on the light gathering power and it depends on the purity of the light resolution is nothing but the resolving power of the monochromator it is the ability to distinguish between separate entities adjacent spectral features then it has the light gathering power the monochromator must have very good light gathering power then the purity of the light output also is very very important so a monochromator must have large dispersion and high resolving power which is necessary to measure the accurate emission spectra when we come to the case of dispersion dispersion is defined as spread of wavelength in space that is separation of mixture of wavelengths into component wavelengths separation of mixture of wavelengths into component wavelengths which can be accomplished by prism or with grating we are going to use two types of dispersive uh, elements where dispersion can be possible with these two types of elements the dispersion which can be possible with these two type of elements are prism and monochrome prism and grating which this dispersion is accomplished by monochromators which is nothing but the prism where we are using the refractive refraction as a refraction phenomena we are going to use and we are going to use grating which is use where we are using diffraction phenomena diffraction phenomena so before we go into the discussion of what is a grating and already i have we have discussed about prism monochroma prism dispersion elements we have going to discuss about grating what is a grating a diffraction grating is an optical component with a periodic structure that splits and diffracts light into several beams traveling in different directions what does a diffraction grating do it is an optical component with a periodic structure that splits and diffracts light into several beams traveling in different directions diffraction grating can be used to separate light of different wavelengths it is used to separate light of different wavelengths with high resolution a diffraction grating is a multiple slit arrangement made by etching lines on transparent pieces of material uh i would like to differentiate between a grating and a prism a grating and a prism what is the difference between a grating and a prism there is uh, the major difference is gratings have 
they are wave uh, prisms are wavelength dependent of dispersion the wavelength is independent of dispersion in gratings it provides simple design formula for constant bandwidth the slit width is fixed in gratings and for constant bandwidth slits with width the requires to be adjusted for constant bandwidth the slits width should be adjusted when we use a prism then reflection gate gratings can be used in uv and ir range reflection gratings can be used in uv and visible and ir range prisms not possible because of absorption stray radiation and higher order spectra affect the performance of gratings effects of stray radiation is very less in the case of a prism so we know we know about the two types the prism and the grating in the prism it works on the phenomena of reflection refraction whereas gratings work on the phenomena of diffraction so prisms uh, in prism it is dependent of dispersion whereas in diffraction in gratings it is independent of dispersion and bandwidth prisms require to for the slit to be adjusted but slit width is you know, is fixed in the case of grating and it is not possible to use refraction process in the case of uv and visible and ir using prisms but reflection gratings can be used in uv visible ir ranges effects of stray radiation is very less in the case of prisms and stray radiation and higher order spectra affect the performance and prisms are less costly and cheaper or are they are cheaper whereas gratings are most cost more costly compared to prisms so these are some of the basic differences between a prism and a diffraction grating so diffraction grating is an optical component with a periodic structure it is having a periodic structure that splits and diffracts light into several beams traveling in different directions diffraction gratings can be used to separate light of different wavelengths with a high resolution a diffraction grating is a multiple slit arrangement made by etching lines on transparent pieces of material you are going to take a transparent piece of material uh, on which you are going to etch lines multiple slit arrangements slits are arranged in a multiple fashion so these lines separate an incident beam of light with high resolution by following principle of diffraction as i told you di gratings are based on the principle of diffraction each of these lines they are opaque and the gap in between the lines transmit light the type of diffraction that is brought about by the diffraction grating with multiple slits is called fraunhofer's diffraction so a diffraction grating has several lines which are separate an incident beam of light with high resolution by following the principle of diffraction each of these lines are opaque the gap in between them between the lines transmit the light the type of ray diffraction that is brought about by the diffraction grating with multiple slits is called fraunhofer's diffraction now you can observe the figure there it there you have the grating which is etched from transparent material and you have several slits like lines which are cut in the grating okay diffraction grating is nothing but see you can see in the figure there the diffraction grating is nothing but any arrangement which is equivalent in its action to a number of to a number of parallel equidistant slits of same width is called a diffraction grating as shown in the figure a diffraction grating is nothing but any arrangement which is equivalent to its in its action to a number of parallel equidistant slits of the same width is called diffraction grating it consists of number of parallel equally spaced grooves ruled by a properly shaped diamond tool 
directly into a highly polished surface. These grooves are made by diamond, diamond tool you are using. You can see the cross section of the dry fracturing grating as shown in the figure. When the light is incident, when you are in a light is incident on the surface of the grating, what happens? The incident ray, then you have the reflected ray, then you have the diffracted ray, then you we have the blaze angle. Okay. Each groove of the grating has a broad space exposed to the incident light. You got the broad space seen in the figure there. Each groove is, is exposed to broad space face okay of the incident light the light incident on each groove is diffracted that means it is spread out over a range of angles the light incident on each groove is spread over a range of angles at certain angles reinforcement or constructive interference occurs as, ta as stated by the grating formula okay at certain angles, what happens? Re constructive interference occurs when it is given by the famous formula B is equal to B into sin i plus or minus sin r is equal to m into lambda and uh, where B is the grating constant and all these parameters you will be learning in your further classes. So, the resolving part, one of the tech, one of the, the uh, important characteristics of any monochromatories you should have high resol resolving power the resolution must be more it is given by the relation r is equal to lambda by d lambda is equal to n into capital n where lambda is called the wavelength okay and d lambda and small n and capital n capital n is the number of lines uh, illuminated by the radiation from the entrance slit. Number of lines illuminated by the radiation from the entrance slit. So, the relation is R is equal to lambda by D lambda into N into capital N where N is the number of lines illuminated by the radiation for from entrance slit. So, resolving power must be high to for a uh, monochromator to have very good dispersion high it, it should have high degree of resolution construction of a grating a diffraction grating consists of flat pieces of transparent material on which lines have been grooved on which lines have been grooved A diffraction grating consists of flat pieces of transparent material on which lines have been grooved or etched, having uniform gaps in between. These lines are etched by photolithographic technique and digital planar holography. So, when we want to construct a grating, a diffraction grating consists of a flat piece of transparent material on which Lines have been etched having uniform gaps in between these lines and they are etched by photolithographic technique. These lines are grooved or etched. The process of etching is used here and that process is of etching is, uh, by, by, is done by the process of photolithographic technique and the digital planar holography. Then what are the applications of grating? Some of the typical applications of diffraction grating are as below. What are they? They are used in atomic spectra measurements, optical spectrometers, monochromators and wavelength multiplexing devices. These are the applications where we are going to use diffraction gratings. In analytical instruments, uh, we are going to analyze the samples. So, gratings are used for atomic spectra measurement. They are used for optical spectrometers. They are used in optical spectrometers, monochromators and wavelength multiplexing devices. Then what are the advantages and disadvantages of grating? Advantages of grating dispersion nearly is constant with wavelength and they are simpler monochromators. 
these monochromatas are very simple better dispersion for small for same size these are the advantages dispersion nearly constant with wavelength simpler monochromatas and better dispersion for same size disadvantages of grating they have the effects of stray radiation and have higher order spectra these are the disadvantages higher order spectra then now we have studied about grating now we are going to study about grating monochromatos grating monochromatos the components of grating monochromatos are we have the entrance slit we have the collimating lens we have the grating as the dispersive device dispersive element then we have the focusing lens then the exit slit so grating monochromatos disperse ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation grating monochromatos disperse ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation a grating consists of hard optical flat surface that has a large number of parallel and closely spaced grooves it has large number of parallel and closely spaced grooves a grating for the ultraviolet and visible region typically has 300 to 2000 grooves so a grating has for the ultraviolet and visible region typically has 300 to 2000 grooves per mm however 1200 to 1400 grooves per mm is most common so how many grooves it can have when we are using a grating for the ultraviolet and visible region its number of grooves ranges from 300 to 200 2000 grooves per mm whereas uh, for uh, ultraviolet it is 300 to 2000 and for visible it is 1200 to 1400 grooves per mm for the infrared region gratings used usually have 10 to 200 grooves for the infrared region the number of grooves is very very less so what are the components of grating monochromata as i told you earlier the grating monochromata consists of the entrance slit the collimating element now comes the grating as a dispersive element and focusing element or the focusing lenses and exit slit an entrance slit that provides a narrow optical image of the radiation source the entrance slit provides a narrow optical image of the radiation source a collimator makes the light rendered parallel from the entrance slit then a grating or a prism a grating in this case it is used for dispersing the incident radiation then a collimator which reforms the images of the desired spectral band exit slit is used to isolate the desired spectral band grating monochromata the grating monochromata as shown in the figure you can observe the grating monochromata as shown in the figure it consists of the entrance slit then the collimating lens here the concave mirrors are used as a collimating lens and the uh, or the focusing lens uh, collimating lens from the the radiation or the uh, radiation falling on the collimating lens they are made to focus on to the reflection grating which is shown as a wavy wavy lines here and from the reflection grating the radiation is is reflected back on to the focusing lens and from the focusing lens it goes on to the exit slit grating monochromata within grating monochromata a fine beam of light a fine beam of light
within grating monochromata a fine beam of light from the source falls on the concave mirror by an entrance slit let me show you the figure so that you can understand what i am talking about within the grating monochromata within the grating monochromata a fine beam of light from the source fall on a concave mirror by an entrance slit this is then reflected on the grating that disperses it the dispersed radiation is then directed to an exit slit the range of wavelengths isolated through the monochromata is determined through the extent of dispersion through the grating and the width of the exit slit rotation of the grating within a predetermined way could be used to acquire the desired wavelength from the exit slit so within the monochromata a fine beam of light from the source falls on the concave mirror by an entrance slit this is then reflected on the grating that disperses it the dispersed radiation is then directed to an exit slit the range of wavelengths is isolated through the monochromata is dis is determined through the extent of dispersion through the grating and the width of the exit slit rotation of the grating within a predetermined way could be used to acquire the desired wavelength for the exit slit so this is how you are going to how the la, grating monochromata is used the grating monochromata within the grating monochromata is a fine beam of the light from the source which falls on the concave mirror by an entrance slit this is then reflected on the grating that disperses it the dispersed radiation is then dropped it is then directed on to an exit slit the range of wavelengths isolated through the monochromata is determined through the extent of dispersion through the grating and the width of the great exit slit rotation of the grating within a predetermined way could be used to acquire the desired wavelengths from the exit slit now coming to the light sources the different types of radiation sources are used the radiation sources used for this process is we are using the different radiation sources the in the uv visible and ir near ir region different radiation sources are used so we are going to discuss about the radiation sources radiation source is an absorption spectrometry it has two basic functions what is the purpose of the light source or the radiation source they must provide sufficient radiant energy over the wavelength regions where absorption is to be measured what should they do they must be able to provide sufficient radiant energy over the wavelength region where absorption is to be measured and they they should maintain a constant light intensity two things they have to do the right sources or the radiation sources they must provide sufficient radiant energy over the wavelength region where the absorption is to be measured where you are going to use them in which region you are going to use so in that region the radiant energy must be sufficient enough to absorb that wavelength and they must have constant light intensity they should maintain the intensity of the light constant and during the entire over the entire time interval during which absorption measurements are made in the design consideration it must be remembered that flux density of the radiant energy varies inversely as
the source as square of the distance from the source. So, the, the one of the most important uh, light, light source in the visible or UV or IR region is the hydrogen H2D2, hydrogen or deuterium discharge lamps. We have the different types of discharge lamps, hydrogen or deuterium discharge lamps. Hydrogen or deuterium discharge lamps are used in UV region and are operated under the low pressure. Okay, the hydrogen and deuterium discharge lamps are used in which region? UV region and are operated under low pressure that is at 0.225 torrs and low voltage. That voltage is approximately 40 volts DC conditions. Okay, we are using hydrogen and deuterium discharge lamps. In this discharge lamps, heated cathode provides the essential functions of maintaining the discharge. The cathode is heated. You have a, in the lamps, we have a cathode and an anode. The heated cathode provides the essential functions of maintaining the discharge. The discharge has negative temperature versus resistance characteristics. A vital feature of these lamps is hydrogen deuterium discharge lamps. One of the vital features of this lamp is a mechanical aperture, aperture, I am sorry, a mechanical aperture between the cathode and the anode which constricts the discharge to a narrow path. That is an important vital feature in this lamp. You have a narrow aperture between the cathode and the anode which constricts the discharge, which constricts means which obstructs the discharge. Normally, the anode is placed close to the aperture which creates an intensity radiating ball of light of about 0.6 to 1.5 mm in diameter on the cathode side of the opening. So here in the first part, uh, first uh, among the light sources which you are using, you, you are using hydrogen deuterium lamps, discharge lamps, H2D3 lamps they are called. These lamps, their construction is you are having a cathode and an anode, heated cathode, the heated cathode, uh, it provides the main function of maintaining the discharge. The discharge is having negative temperature quotient. A vital feature of the lamp is you have a mechanical aperture between the cathode and the anode, this which constructs the discharge to a narrow path. Normally, the anode is placed closer to the cathode which creates an intensity, intensely radiating ball of light of about 0.6 to 1.5 mm in diameter on the cathode side of the wing. The use of deuterium in place of hydrogen slightly increases the size of the light ball. When the light ball, uh, to increase the size, you are going to replace hydrogen by deuterium and enhances brightness to 3 to 5 times. The brightness of the illumination of the light source can be enhanced by using deuterium in place of hydrogen. How the size of the ball increases and the brightness increases to 3 to 5 times when, it, when compared to hydrogen. Below 360 nanometers, these discharge lamps provide a strong continuous which fulfill the most needs of the UV region. Most needs between 360 to uh, 360, below 360 nanometers. Okay, they are useful in the UV region. And wavelengths range from 150 to 160 to 375 nanometers. The wavelength of this uh, lamps uh, produce is between 150 to 375 nanometers and uh, below 360 nanometers they are best suitable for UV region. They are best suitable for UV region. Then we have the other types that is uh, the we have incandescent filament lamps are also used. Measurements above 350 nanometers and into the near infrared to 2.5 micrometers when you are using uh, in the near infrared region beyond um, uh, 350 nanometers usually made with incandescent lamps, filament lamps which give continuously over this range which give the spectra over this entire range 350 to 2.5 micrometers. 
in these lamps in the incandescent lamps we have a wire filament generally consisting of tungsten and it is heated this wire filament tungsten double omega it is called it is heated in to incandescence by an electrical current the feature of the construction feature of incandescent lamps is it is generally made up of tungsten and it is heated to incandescence by an electric current the filament is encompassed enclosed or enclosed in a hermetical sealed bulb of glass that is filled with an inert gas or it is made vacuum okay the filament filament is generally in the incandescent lamp the filament is generally made up of tungsten omega filament that is called tungsten it is heated to incandescence by an electric current the filament is enclosed in a hermit hermetical sealed bulb this filament is enclosed in a hermetical sealed bulb of glass that is filled with inert gas or a vacuum filaments are usually coiled to increase their emissivity and mean luminescence incandescent lamps are rugged they are of low cost units sufficiently bright for nearly all absorption works in the uv and the visible region even the xenon arc lamps xc arc lamps are also used they are used between the range of 250 to uh, 600 nanometers and have maximum current at 500 nanometers they have maximum current at 500 nanometers so coming to the tungsten filament halogen lamps the tungsten halogen lamps are special class with iodine added to a normal filling gases they are special class in added to a normal filling gases the envelope is fabricated of quartz to tolerate a very high lamp operating temperature of 3500 degree kelvin okay tungsten halogen lamps they are called tungsten halogen lamps tungsten halogen lamps are special class with iodine added to normal gas filling gases in okay you are going to add iodine the envelope is fabricated of quartz to tolerate a higher lamp operating temperature of 3500 degree kelvin the iodine combines chemically at the bulb wall with sublimed tungsten okay the tungsten begins to sublime so this iodine reacts with tungsten to form wi2 wi2 gas tungsten iodine gas which migrates and back to the hot filament where it decomposes and tungsten is redeposited unfortunately the tungsten lamp emits the major portion of its energy in the near infrared it's it emits major portion of its energy in the near and infrared with a maximum of about 1000 nanometers and drops off very rapidly in the uv to 1 by 100th of that value at about 300 nanometers its wavelength is between 320 to 2500 nanometers it needs close weak control so this is about the light sources which you are going to use we are using the hydrogen deuterium lamps these lamps are nothing but discharge uh, lamps are nothing but uh, discharge tubes which consists of uh, uh, which are mainly used in the uv region hydrogen deuterium lamps are used in the uv region in that region you are going to maintain the temperature inside the uh, lamp at a very low temperature of 0.2 to 0.5 to 5 torrs and a very low voltage approximately 40 volts per dc and the cathode is heated which provides the essential function of maintaining the discharge the discharge is maintained by the cathode uh, the when the cathode uh, emits the discharge uh, you have an anode in the cathode in between there is a speci- uh, special mechanical aperture there is a 
special mechanical aperture which constricts the discharge to the to a narrow path the use of deuterium in the place of hydrogen is slightly increases uh, the size of the light ball you are going to produce a light ball that is the light source uh, you, if you are replacing deuterium with the help of uh, hydrogen when you are uh, replacing hydrogen uh, deuterium in place of hydrogen the light ball size increases and it also the brightness increases 3 to 5 times that of the hydrogen and the wavelength region is between 150 to 375 then we have studied about xenon arc lamps whose spectral wave whose wavelength is between 250 to uh, 600 nanometers and maximum current of about 500 nanometers and uh, tungsten filaments in tungsten halogen lamps are special class with iodine added to the normal filling gases the envelope is uh, fabricated of quartz to tolerate a higher lamp operating conditions of temperature of about 3500 degrees centigrade at that very high uh, 3500 degree kelvin iodine combines chemically uh, uh, at the bulb wall with sublimed tungsten resulting in tungsten iodine gas which migrates back to the hot filament where it gets deposited and the tungsten is regenerated or redeposited it is used in the near infrared region 350 to 2500 nanometers under very very careful closed control so this is about your light sources which we have studied and to summarize our topics today in this presentation we have studied about diffraction grating a diffraction grating is an optical component with a periodic structure that splits and diffracts light into several beams traveling in different directions. So a diffraction grating is an optical component with a periodic structure that splits and diffracts light into several beams traveling in different directions then the other objective which we have studied here in this presentation is the grating monochromata monochromata is nothing but which produces a single color mono means chrome mono monochrome mono means single chrome means color so it is going to produce a spectral wave uh, produce a radiation of specific wavelengths so this grating monochromatas consists of entrance slit the collimating element which may be either a lens or a mirror concave mirror in the case of grating monochromatas then we have grating as a dispersion element then the focusing element which is used to focus your uh, output onto a exit slit focus the output of the entrance slit onto an exit slit then we have the exit slit Coming to the last topic which we have dealt is types of light sources for visible UV and IR. We are used, we have seen the different types of light sources. The light, main purpose of a light source is radiation source must have must provide sufficient radiant radiant energy. That is the first and foremost importance of a light source. It must produce, it must provide sufficient radiant energy over the wavelength region where absorption is to be measured the fundamental uh, uh, function of any radiation source or light source is it must provide sufficient radiant energy over the 
वेव लेंथ रीजियन वेयर एब्जॉर्बेशन इज टू बी मेजर्ड इट मे बी इन द विजिबल रीजन और यू वी रीजन और आई आर रीजन वॉट एवर रीजन वी आर गोइंग टू यूज इट इट मस्ट प्रोवाइड सफिशेंट रेडियंट एनर्जी सेकेंडली देन इट शुड मेंटेन अ कॉन्स्टेंट लाइट इंटेंसिटी ओवर द एंड ओवर द टाइम इंटरवेल ड्यूरिंग ड्यूरिंग विच एब्जॉर्बेशन मेजरमेंट्स आर मेड इट मस्ट maintain a constant light rate intensity must maintain a it first and foremost thing is what the radiation source should do it must produce the sufficient radiant energy in which region it is being used for absorption and then second thing is the radiation that is being uh, it should maintain a constant intensity light intensity over the time during which absorption meter, measurements are made the intensity of the radiation of the light source must be constant it should not vary these two factors uh, these two functions or these two factors must be considered very carefully when you are choosing a light source the light source must be able to produce sufficient energy uh, where it is being used and in the second thing it must be able to uh, able to maintain a constant light intensity the intensity of the light must be maintained constant over the time in the design construction consideration it must be remembered that flux density of the radiant energy varies inversely as a square of the distance from the source so we have discussed about hydrogen and deuterium uh, discharge lamps the uh, where the well Di where where hydrogen can be replaced by deuterium when you want to increase the size of the light ball and the intensity or the brightness of the uh, ball can be increased three to five times. We are uh, and it is used in UV region. Mostly it is used in UV region and its uh, wavelength is extending from one sixty to three seventy five nanometers. One sixty to three seventy five nanometers. and you must use the quartz window and cuvettes in this when you are using with the hydrogen de uh, deuterium discharge lamps then we have incandescent lamps they are used mostly in the near infrared region and uh, they are also uh, these lamps are wire filaments generally consisting of uh, tungsten which is heated to incandescence or xenon arc lamps where you are using xenon gas by an electric current the filament is enclosed in a a uh, hermetical sealed bulbs of glass and uh, it is filled up with inert gas or vacuum the filaments are usually coiled to increase their emissivity incandescent lamps are uh, rugged and low cost units sufficiently bright for absorption in the uv or the visible region we are also going to use incandescent lamps also for the uv and visible region and lastly we are we have dealt with tungsten filaments tungsten filaments uh, or tungsten uh, halogen lamps where the uh, halogens are used either iodine mostly iodine is used iodine is added in addition to normally filled gases uh, the envelope is fabricated at a very high to work at a very high temperature at the high temperature of 3500 degrees kelvin iodine combines with the tungsten which sublimes on the walls of the bulb Uh, and when it combines uh when this uh, chemical reaction takes place it produces uh, iodine uh, tungsten iodine gas which migrates back to the filament and it gets deposited redeposited uh, it decomposes and deposits as redeposits as tungsten so this is used in the near infrared region and its spectral range is between 350 to 2500 nanometers so we have discussed all the topics we have discussed about grating we have discussed about diffraction grating the importance of grating the advantages of grating the disadvantages their applications we have discussed about grating monochromator which consists of the major five blocks five components it consists of and we have studied about the different light sources which we are going to use in the different regions uh, light sources which we are going to use in the different regions
that is the visible and the uv and the ir regions thank you one and all